So Lord, I thank you that you are a rescuer. I thank you for the band that just told us that, and we all sang that. And uh, Jesus, I pray that you would help us to believe that, because I don't think any of us really do all that much. You're the van. You're the way. You're the life. So God, as we preach, I pray that we would get into you. Um, and Father, of course, I pray this in his name, because he's the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, uh, this is our 13th sermon from 1 Peter. Um, and Peter is painting a, a picture, a picture that's consistently biblical and yet remarkably different from what we have often heard preached. And so if you haven't been following the messages, don't expect to comprehend everything, but you can relax, knowing that everything is Jesus. And I'm not saying that figuratively. I'm saying it literally. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end, the telos, the completion, the perfection is at hand. The, the end of all things is at hand. For the past three weeks, uh, we've been preaching about the end, and most people seem to have rather ambivalent feelings about the end. So they say stuff like, you better get your crap together because the end is at hand. They come to church and say, Pastor, I need some more knowledge of good and evil so I can prepare myself for the end that's at hand. We've seen that the end is a day, the seventh day, that is a kingdom, that is a boat, that is a tabernacle, that is a temple, that is a person, that is the way, that is like the van, that is at hand, parked right here in the garden of, of your heart. Jesus said, I am the end and the beginning and the way. No one comes to the Father but by me, and oh yeah, the Father is in me. He's driving the van. Three weeks ago, I preached a sermon titled Journey to the Magic Kingdom, Get in the Van, and I told the story of driving my family to Disney World, but surprising the kids in Junction City, Kansas with that news, only to discover that the kids did not want to get back into the van and keep driving to the Magic Kingdom because they had set their hopes on the bowling alley in Junction City, Kansas. If there is an end to all things, then all things are on a journey to that end. And the only thing that doesn't end is the end. And perhaps things that have been filled with the end or are hidden in the end, things that actually become the end. Two weeks ago, I preached a sermon titled The Magic Kingdom in the Van. Mostly, I talked about the nature of the kingdom so that you might actually believe it could be at hand and fit in a van. We talked about space, time, and eternity. Remember, we talked about flatland and other dimensions and things that to us would seem unreal, but would actually be more real than anything that our three-dimensional brains could comprehend here in Flatland, this world. We talked about the uncaused cause, who is love. But we often mistake love for things like testosterone, or our emotions and decisions, or our own will. Last week, John Perch gave an absolutely wonderful message titled, Enter the Garden. He could have and almost did title it, Get in the Van, right? Didn't you? You told me that, almost. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed the most astounding prayer, okay? Think about this. He, God in flesh, prayed, nevertheless, not my will. God in flesh prayed, not my will. What is not God's will? Well, wouldn't that be bad will? Like our will? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Thy will is God's will. That's, that's good will. Nevertheless, not my will, that's Adam's will. But thy will, that's God's will. 
But who, 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 who is willing to not will Adam's will, but God's will? Because see, that's like a third will. Answer, the God-man. Jesus, our Father in flesh, come to get us in the van. Lots to think about there. But in Junction City, what I'm saying is my will became my children's will as together we got in the van, and that's called faith. That's the way to the seventh day. The seventh day doesn't start until Jesus, the perfect image of God, hangs on a tree in a garden on the sixth day of creation, on the sixth day of the week, at the sixth hour, and cries, it is finished. It's at that tree that we are given eternal life, seventh day life. And that means the big story is not that God made everything good, we mess it up, and now he's trying to fix it with the whole Jesus thing. The big story is that he's making us in his image with his word, who is Jesus, and he won't fail. It means our Father is taking us on a journey, and we will all arrive at our destination. But on the sixth day, we all find ourselves at a junction. It's a place where we make a choice, or should I say the Father creates a choice in us. It's the place where His choice becomes our choice. And we choose to get in the van. Jesus is the van. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the Father's choice, and surrendering our choice to His choice is called faith. You know, it just about killed my kids to get in the van. And yet, they finally did get in the van. Maybe they saw that it killed me, that it was killing them. They knew that their pain was my pain. And so my pleasure was their pleasure. So they had just enough faith in me to get in the van. But what if they hadn't gotten in the van? Would I have left them forever in Junction City or consigned them to endless torment? No, because that wouldn't make me happy. Their pleasure is my pleasure. You know, I hate going to copyright protected theme parks without my kids. It's their happiness that makes the Magic Kingdom magic for me. Well, if they hadn't gotten in the van, I wouldn't have consigned them to endless torment. However, I might have granted their bad choice for a time that my good choice might become their choice in time. Maybe that's why God made time. In other words, I might have said, fine, you can just stay in Junction City, but I would have stayed with them. I would have descended into that hell with them. Then after three weeks of sitting in front of the Dairy Queen and wandering around the Walmart like zombies, mumbling, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I would have said, now, let's get in the van. You know, until we got to Junction City, the Magic Kingdom was only my choice. But as I shut the van door, my choice became our choice. Granted, it was only the size of a mustard seed, but the seed grew and became a kingdom. And that's how we got the hell out of Junction City. So why stop in Junction City at all? Why does God allow this fallen world at all? I don't think I can fully answer that question, but I do know that stopping in Junction City made the Magic Kingdom that much more magic. Over and over again, it happened. We'd be standing in line for Space Mountain, or we'd be eating those giant turkey legs that they call alien legs. One of the kids would just stop me. Their eyes would get huge, and they'd just exclaim, Oh, Daddy, I can't believe that I wanted to stay in Junction City. I love you. It means... I trust you, and that's called faith. You know, all sorts of folks visit copyright-protected theme parks and have a hell of a time. I mean, it feels like hell because they don't have faith in love. You see, faith in love, and God our Father is love, faith in love is what makes the magic kingdom magic for us. And that means the magic really starts in the van. My kids are young adults now, and they love to reminisce about family vacations. And this is the crazy thing. They don't seem to miss any copyright-protected, world-famous theme parks. 
You know what they miss? Our time in the van. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel and get in the van. Well, that's the end of the film, that uh, the short film that we, the sanctuary, made about nine years ago. Um, that you can watch on our website, or you can find on on YouTube. It, it's titled "Journey of the Magic Kingdom," and I love the way that Ben Ben Sullivan ended the film with a picture of a family in a van uh, laughing. Faith isn't a, a one-time decision. We're saved by grace through faith, but we also travel. We walk by faith through grace and in grace. It's faith and hope, faith and hope in love, faith and love that makes the magic kingdom magic. I ended our last message from 1 Peter with a thought experiment, but I had no time to run the experiment. So I want us to run the thought experiment today, okay? This is what I said. I said, imagine if I finally got the kids in the van in Junction City, and then I turned around and I said uh, this to them, statement number one. If I said, look, I'm going to the Magic Kingdom, and the two of you that love me most and love me the best, I'll take with me into the Magic Kingdom when we arrive. But the other two who don't love me most and don't love each other best, I'll sell for medical testing in Florida and I'll never ever see you again. If I had said that to my kids, they wouldn't believe that because they know me. But if they didn't know me and they did believe that statement, what would have happened on our, on our journey in the van? Would they have loved each other well, and would they have loved me at all, or maybe only pretended uh, to love me for fear of what might happen if they, they did not. But now imagine if I turned around, I looked them in the eyes, and I said this, statement number two, look, I'm taking you all to the magic kingdom, even if it kills me. But none of us can arrive at the magic kingdom until all of us arrive at the magic kingdom because you all are my magic kingdom. Would that be different? I mean, if I've said that, what would have happened? I, I mean, I, I think if they had, had uh, believed that, it, it would be different. But, but what if they, uh, statement number one, what would have happened if they believe statement number one, you know, some go in and some are endlessly out. Well, number one, they would not have believed that there's one end to all things, right? But instead, there are two equal opposite ends forever at odds with each other, perfect bliss and perfect torment. And number two, secondly, they would have believed that the end is dependent on their choices, right? Their decisions. The end is dependent on their judgment. So their own judgment would be their own damnation or salvation. Their own desecration or creation. In theological lingo, the magic kingdom would be entirely dependent on their ability to obey the law. Love dad and love each other. Someone once asked the neurotic young monk, Martin Luther, do you, do you love God? And he said, love God. Sometimes I hate him. Number three, commanded to love me or else, they might try to love me, but they would secretly and utterly despise me, and least of all, trust me. Least of all, trust me, because I had told them to love and then threatened them with not love. That would make you neurotic. Number four, and commanded to love each other or else they might pretend to love each other while secretly delighting in each other's failure. In the name of love, they would compete. Each would try to be first by making the other last. Each would try to exalt themselves by humiliating another. And every difference would be considered a threat. That's what it's like when you compete. 
And in the name of love, they would divide. So even if they all acted just the same out of fear, which is what we do, right? We act just the same out of fear. Even if they did, they would each be utterly alone. In Scripture, death, remember, is being alone. They wouldn't know me or each other except to use me or each other for their own purposes. Pretending to love, everything would die. And now if you're, you're honest, if you're astute, you'll say, well, uh, okay, fine, preacher. That's just the way things are. That's the way of this world. That's the survival of the fittest. And the reality that, well, actually none survive, we all die. Right. <laughs> it is. Peter and Paul call that the flesh. It's the way our physical and psychic bodies operate, how they grow. They eat life and they poop death. It's a little shocking when you focus on it. It explains the Third Reich. It explains class warfare, explains your anxiety at the spelling bee in third grade, and the rot that is currently eating our country and political system in 2024. And, and if you say, well, no father would ever say that to his kids. Correct. But haven't we said that our father has said it to all of us? His children? You know, Jesus said to everyone, call him our dad, our father. And, and we, the church, have taught people, the institutional church, we've taught people to pray our father. And then we, the church, the institutional church, have said there isn't one end to all things. There are two. Endless bliss and endless torment. And where you'll end up is, well, it's dependent on your choice. Your faith or lack of faith. Your works or lack of works. Or maybe uh, dad's grace or, or dad's lack of grace, but you can know which, whether you get dad's grace or lack of grace, by, you know, judging your own judgments. That is your choice. Church didn't always say that. But once we became part of Rome, we did. In 1054, the Pope, supposedly following Peter, excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. And the Patriarch of Constantinople, in turn, excommunicated the Pope. He said the other was going to hell, and that's how the Roman Catholic Church was born, <laughs> which means Roman Universal Church, and how the Orthodox Church was born. 1521, Martin Luther was excommunicated by the Pope, and in turn labeled him the Antichrist. And that's how the Protestant churches were born. Short time later, Lutherans, Calvinists, Anabaptists, they all started excommunicating each other over primarily, you know what? Communion of all things. And then England and America got into the whole deal where we'll send people to hell just for hoping that Jesus is successful and where we've got seriously a separate denomination for every spiritual gift. No, maybe hundreds for every spiritual gift. And hopefully you realize that the church is supposedly the van, the body of Christ in this world. You see, I'm just saying that with statement number one, I would turn my children into hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, and the walking dead. Number five, it would be hell in the van. But imagine if I turned around, looked them in the eye, such that, you know, they saw themselves reflected in my eye, like the apple of my eye, and I said, look, I'm taking all of you to the, to the magic kingdom. Even if it kills me, I'm taking you to the magic kingdom. But none of us can arrive in the magic kingdom until all of us arrive in the magic kingdom because you all will, you're my magic kingdom. That would be different. You know, it's what God tells us in Genesis chapter 1, and then through 2 verse 3. It's what he tells us right at the start of Scripture. Even though some missed the boat in the days of Noah, and Peter just talked about that, and it's what God tells Israel throughout the entire Old Testament, even though almost all, including Moses, were lost in the wilderness and sunk into Sheol, which is also translated hell, it's what Peter's telling us right now. 
And why the gospel is preached even to the dead, that although judging the flesh the way men are, like Peter just told us, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And you see, that changes things. Well, if I said that, statement number two to my children in Junction City, after I got them all in the van, you see, number one, they would know that there's one end. One end. Even if they lose hope, even if they hide in the park, even if they slow us down along the way, one end. And number two, they would know that the end is not dependent on their judgment. The end is my judgment on which they would now depend. The end is not their choice. It's my choice coming to fruition with them, like within them, you know, like an eternal seed planted in the soil of each and every little heart. They would know and therefore maybe begin to repent. Perhaps even change their ways. And now our text, 1 Peter 4, 7, the end that tell us of all things is at hand, therefore... What is the therefore, therefore? The end, the telos of all things is at hand, therefore, sophroneo, be of literally saved mind, sound mind. In other words, wake up. I think self-controlled is probably a bad translation because it's the illusions of the self that we need to wake up from. The end of all things is at hand, therefore, wake up and nepho is the verb, get sober. We're drunk on the illusion that we're in control. So if you think you're in control, you're dreaming, and you're going to wake up. Nepho is also translated watch, as in wake and watch with me. If someone wakes you from a dream, what do they do? They usually speak a, a word that doesn't fit in your dream, right? You hear the word coming in from the outside and it messes with reality in your head. A dream, you see, is the product of your own mind. Jesus is the word spoken into the world that we think we have created. There were two times when Peter struggled to wake and to watch. John talked about one last week, Garden of Gethsemane, Luke twenty-two forty-five. 45. Luke writes, they slept for sorrow. And Jesus says, watch and pray that you might not enter temptation. The other was in Luke 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration. Quote, Peter was heavy with sleep. Isn't that wild? You see, both times Peter longed to be in control, but he needed to wake up to sorrow and then to endless delight, joy, the glory of God. The end of all things is at hand, writes Peter. Therefore, wake up and get sober. Now pay attention. These are the only two imperative verbs, okay? An imperative verb, you know, is a command verb. The only imperative verbs in our text this morning. Wake up, get sober, which I think another word for that is repent, right? That Get a new mind. Think differently about this thing. That's the prescription. Wake up and get sober. And now the description. The translator has added three imperative verbs, because I think that makes sense to us, turned uh, three participles into imperative verbs. But literally, this is what Peter is saying. Therefore, wake up and get sober for the sake of your prayers, above all, having the earnest love in one another, having the relentless love in one another, since the love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers sin. Just like the slaughtered lamb stands on the covering of the ark. The atonement seat, which is the throne of God on top of the ark, containing the law in the holy of holies in the depths of the temple. And remember, Peter has gone to great lengths to remind us that we are the temple. The living temple. Having the love in one another, since the love covers a multitude of sins, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, using it to serve one another as good stewards of God's manifold, varied 
grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles, logion of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory and the dominion into the ages of the ages. Amen. So anyway, if in the van in Junction City, I turned around, looked my kids in the eye, you know, such that they saw that they were the apple of my eye, and I said this, uh, look, I'm taking you all, I'm taking you all to the Magic Kingdom, even if it kills me. But none of us can arrive in the Magic Kingdom till all of us arrive in the Magic Kingdom, because you all are my Magic Kingdom. And believe it or not, I am yours. If I said that and even demonstrated that, they might begin to know that, number one, there is one end, one magic kingdom. Number two, that end is not dependent on their judgment. The end is my judgment on which they depend. And number three, they might trust me and actually begin to love me or continue to love me even if it hurt, for this love is not simply a commandment. It's not a threat. It's a promise guaranteed with an oath like a covenant. You know, when Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree in the garden, their, their, their differences suddenly became threats. And they covered them with fig leaves. And humanity was threatened with extinction by our own will, for it's only in the unity of our diversity, that is, the communion of our differences, that two become what? One flesh, and life is born. In the Garden of Eden, where they hid alone in, in darkness, and in that garden, God then found them. They didn't find him, he found them. And clothed them, remember, with what? The skin of a sacrifice. But it was a lamb. And in the garden of Calvary, God found us and clothed us with himself. He is love in the flesh. He's our helper. He's the one who holds all things together with what? His blood. His life. To repent is to wake up and see that although we take his life on the tree, he has always forgiven his life on the tree from the very foundation of the world. Our father is love. And we can only love because he first loved us. We don't create love. Love creates us. Love is the uncaused cause. You will love the Lord your God with all your... How are you going to love the Lord? Are you going to make love? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you will love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's not just a command. You will. That's a promise. He, he didn't say you should, but you, you will. It's an oracle of God. It's a word that will not return void. It's a promise guaranteed with an oath. It's a slaughtered lamb standing on the ark of the covenant, the throne. Dad is telling you, look, we're going to Magic Kingdom. We're going to the Magic Kingdom, but even if it kills me. But none of us can arrive at the Magic Kingdom until all of us arrive at the Magic Kingdom because y'all are my Magic Kingdom. And I am yours. Well, number four, I think they might actually start loving each other. Even as they love themselves, because you see, they would see themselves. They would see the promised seed in each other. No longer competing, but cooperating. They might discover that their differences were not a curse, but actually a blessing. You know, it turns out that, that my, my wife is, is different than me. And that's not a curse, but a blessing. You know, our Father sees himself in you. 1 Peter 1, 23. You have been begotten again of imperishable seed. Paul tells us that God alone has immortality. You've been born again of imperishable seed. Our Father. I had a good father. I really miss his hugs. And the way he would look at me. As if there was like an imperishable kingdom inside of me. And the worse I, I behaved, the more his look, it burned. 
And yet the more it, it burned, the more I knew that he would never let me go, so I might as well just surrender. And he saw it. He saw this imperishable seed in my sisters as well. I mean, imagine that, because they were very different than me. And to be honest, they were kind of a pain in the butt to me. So anyway, if I turned and said that, we're going to the magic kingdom, even if it kills me, uh, but none of us can arrive till all of us can uh, uh, arrive because you are my magic kingdom. We see number four, I think they might actually start loving each other, even as they love themselves, for they'd see themselves in the other, no longer competing but cooperating. They might discover that their differences were not a curse but a blessing. And like I said, it turns out that my wife was also different than me. And I have discovered that that's not actually a curse, but a blessing. I mean, she has physical differences. Not a curse, but a blessing. She has psychological differences. She has spiritual, amazing spiritual differences. There was a time that those differences terrified me, and, and now they, they thrill me, for what's hers is mine and mine is hers, and sharing our differences can actually be quite invigorating. In verse 10, Peter writes, As each one has received a gift, using it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. In verse Corinthians 12, Paul writes, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then he lists some things like words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, gifts of healing, helping, administrating. In Romans, he had service, teaching, exhortation, generosity, leadership, mercy, and good cheer. In both 1 Corinthians and Romans, he says that God has arranged it this way because we are a body. And then he expounds on the most excellent way. I grew up in church. So I grew up filling up questionnaires about what your spiritual gifts were to figure out what your gifts were, what your buddy's gifts were. And then also going to classes to find out how to use your gifts and grow your gifts and work, work your, your gifts. You can't really find much of that in scripture and I suspect that's because they're gifts and not works. In the 70s, the charismatic movement came to town and my Ricky friend Ricky Turnquist said, hey, you want to speak in tongues? He said, yep, and he prayed for me, and I started speaking in tongues, wondering, you know, wondering if I was just making it up. I always wanted the really cool gifts, what I considered the supernatural gifts, you know, like prophecy or words of knowledge, where a sentence just, boom, appears in, in your head, uh, but not the lame gifts, you know, like service or, or helps. I wanted the cool gifts, what we call the sign gifts, which is ironic because signs are worthless if you don't read the signs. Signs always point to a, a substance. And signs are less than worthless if you don't seek that substance. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for sign, said Jesus. An evil and adulterous generation seeks sign, not love, adulterous, not love, which all signs point to. In the 80s, I went to seminary and then took the Signs and Wonders course with John Wimber at Fuller, and I was awfully insecure about my gifts, and I was intimidated by other people's gifts because there were some pretty amazing ones, as, as, if, as if, you know, maybe God loved them more than, than me, and so I was tempted to be happy when people were not healed. And I was uh, tempted when prophetic words uh, did not fit and so were not true. Tempted to feel better about myself. And I was tempted to hope that everyone would be just like me. Insecure. And that's about the time I discovered that my wife, who was not like me and didn't study her Bible near as hard as me, had all the gifts that I had always wanted all my life. And and then I discovered that that was actually kind of invigorating. <laughs> In the 90s, I went to the Toronto Revival. It wasn't anything that, that I did. In fact, it was the day that God revealed to me that I did not love his bride all that much. And it was the day that I said to God, I quit. I'm done with this whole ministry thing because you don't speak to me. And it was that day, that day, that he literally held me to the floor and heaven descended upon me with such glory that I thought I would die. 
And I believe he told me at that time, Peter, it's not about this. And then it was like he pulled back a veil to all reality. And I saw that he was everywhere and every when. Let me say that again, Flatlanders. (laughs) Everywhere and every when loving me. It was him who had been singing to me through the car stereo as I listened to Bono when I'd be pissed off and sitting in the darkness alone when I was a youth pastor. It was him that was in the flannel graph Jesus on the flannel board when I thought to myself, you know, I kind of like this guy. That, that was him. In other words, heaven had always been at hand. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about ascending to heaven and how you too can ascend to heaven. I think most of our religious arguments and divisions are all about how you can ascend to heaven and not get stuck in hell. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about how he was caught up into the third heaven. And I believe that he was, and I believe that still happens. And yet Jesus came preaching, repent, repent. And then you know what he said? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think that's what Peter just told us. The end of all things. Do you ever worry about the end of all things? Ah, the end of all things. The end of all things, says Peter. It's at hand. In geek in, in Greek. It comes from a noun that refers to the curve of the arm, as if the kingdom, as if the end of all things was right here and you could reach out and hug it. Back in the 70s, my dad never spoke in tongues. I I don't think he had any of the cool gifts. It was weird because everybody else around him seemed to have them, but not dad. In the 80s, I watched as he was slandered and removed from the church that he had just poured his heart into for 15 years. In the 90s, it happened again. In 2004, he died and ascended to heaven. I think he was the most Christ-like man that I have ever known. Recently, a friend who watches online from another country on the other side of the world, she she called me. Um, You can do that now with cell phones. She she called me asking about talking to the dead. You know, if a ghost ever appears, you can rebuke it in the name of Jesus, take authority. She called me uh, asking about talking to the dead, and I said, yeah, that's, that's necromancy. And we should never seek direction from the dead, for they are literally lost. And she said, well, um, I think it was your dad. And I said, well... Um, He's not dead. And she said, oh yeah, that's for sure. The Holy Spirit had me read a page of your book, told me to read this page of a book that I've never read. I read it to him. It was all about him and his last sermon that he preached in your church on the heavenly cloud of witnesses and how he had a vision before he died that he would would show up and listen to to sermons and and watch. She said, he came to, to my house to thank me for encouraging you with the things I've seen in visions. And this is the weird thing. He was just so encouraging, just kept encouraging me. I said, yep, that sounds just like my dad. 17 years ago, our church was enormous. And I was in hot water about to be canned. When a man, my dad had been dead for about three or four years, and and this man, that we were casual friends, he came to my office. He had sent me a letter and said he needed to meet with me. He told me how he had gone to the bathroom (laughs) at four in the morning. And on his way to the bathroom, he was suddenly pressed against the floor, flat against the floor. So he was unable to move. He could not even blink his eyes. And he said he suddenly became aware of this intense desire within himself for a father. And then he said, Peter, I thought of your dad, but I knew he was gone. And then I thought of you, but suddenly 
I saw you. I saw that you were a frightened boy, just like me, barely even able to hold it together. Then your father, Dan, Dan touched me on the shoulder, and he said, in all confidence and joy, Peter looks like he could use a hug. And then he said, I was suddenly filled with love for you. The fear just vanished. I, I, I stood up, and that's why I'm here. And then he hugged me. Do you hear what I'm saying? That was the kingdom of heaven at hand. And heaven was not impressed that my dad could appear to him, could break through the space-time continuum and appear to my dad at four in the morning. That is utterly unimpressive in heaven. Heaven was impressed with the hug because there was love in that hug. And love is the uncaused cause. God is love and all real love is God. There was love in the hug and the same love is in your hug. The kingdom of heaven is literally at hand. The end of all things is literally at hand. And when one stone bleeds into another stone, both begin to live. And he begins to rise. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, if I have prophetic powers, if I have faith to move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing, writes Paul. I'm nothing because love is everything. And love is God. Peter's saying, repent. The end, the kingdom, the telos is at hand. Wake up, get sober. As each has received a gift, using it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. That means that each one of you has gifts. Each one of you. And those gifts are a stewardship of grace. If you think they, you, you earned them, they're, they're not gifts. They're, they're abominations. And if you think that you don't have them, you make God a liar. And if you keep them to yourself, you are an unfaithful steward and need to wake up and surrender to love. You have gifts and you don't have gifts, which is the gift. You learn to love by giving gifts and receiving gifts that you don't have. You will know love when you see that all the gifts are yours in one body. One body of love. You have gifts and you actually are the gift. Each one of you is like a, a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. You know, pieces of jigsaw puzzles are pretty much worthless until you put them together. And they're all pretty much of equal value except for this one, this one up on the screen in my wife's hand. Do you know what's so special about this one? This is the one that was lost. At Christmas, Susan and the girls, we spent hours and hours working on this jigsaw puzzle <laughs> that someone had given my, my daughter we got it all together. I mean, we were so excited. We got it all together. And then there's this right there in the middle, one piece that we couldn't find was missing. We tore the kitchen apart looking for this piece. Last week, Susan found this piece in the cracks, the joints of our kitchen tabletop. She took a picture, sent it to all of us, and we all rejoiced. Why? Because the one that was lost is now found. And that's the way it is in a body. You are, if you're in the van, you confess this. If you're out of the van, you don't know this. But you are a, a member of Christ's body. And he came to seek and to save the lost, the perish, the apolos in Greek, also translated as destroyed. He, he came to seek and to save. So he knows your pain. I'm saying he's utterly aware of you when you're lost. And so he descends into hell just to give you a hug, for you are his kingdom, you're his body, the body of Christ. And don't be surprised if he asks you to give some hugs on his behalf, because you're his arms, and his hands, and his eyes, and his lips. 
And don't be surprised if the best hugs are called forgiveness. You know, Jesus said to Peter, whatever you loose, singular, whatever you loose, Peter, on earth will be loosed in heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In 1054, the Pope used that verse to excommunicate the patriarch of Constantinople and create a descent into hell. But Jesus didn't just say it to Peter. This is the wild thing. Two verses later in Matthew 18, um, he says it to all his disciples. <laughs> Whatever you all loose on earth is loose in heaven. Whatever you all bind on earth is bound in heaven. And, and you see, if you think that one through, that is really confusing. I mean, what if we don't all agree with Peter in Rome? It, it's utterly confusing. Um, Logically, it makes no sense un unless you think of flatland and you postulate levels of heaven, like levels of joy or levels of waking up to the reality, which truly is. In, in Hades, people don't know they're forgiven and so don't forgive, and so all are alone, and, and not even at home in themselves, for they cannot even forgive themselves until, you know, judge in the flesh the way men are, so they might live in the spirit the way God does. But in the highest heaven, and it's interesting in Scripture, heaven is all, often in the plural, in, in the highest heaven, all are forgiven. All bleed grace, one for the other, one into the other, and absolutely everyone is at home in themselves and with each other and in God. And so, you see, it's like the measure you give is literally the measure you get. And so you can't arrive in the highest heaven, the day of our Lord, the seventh day, until you forgive all and so embrace all, that is, the telos of all, which even now and even here is at hand. Verse 11. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles, logion of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything, in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I have learned in an absolute remarkable way that at least sometimes, sometimes when I pray in tongues, Jesus actually speaks through me. And I have found it utterly shocking, which reveals that I don't actually believe that I'm speaking the oracles of God when I preach or read scripture. And I don't really believe that he hugs my neighbor when I hug my neighbor. But according to people, if you serve at all, you are serving by the strength that God supplies. And if you speak truth in love at all, which is actually anything at all, you are speaking the oracles of God, and, and actually it's the Logos that's speaking through you. Don't take credit for that, because that's what we do. The moment we see it, we take credit for it. Don't take credit for it. Don't be terrified of it. Just enjoy it, because Jesus is calling you to share in his joy. To him belongs the glory and the dominion into the ages of the ages. Amen. So anyway, I was just saying that if I spoke good to news to my kids in the van in Junction City, uh, uh, they might repent. And so number one, know that there is one end, one magic kingdom, and know that this is my judgment, not theirs. And so number three, love me because they trust me. And number four, begin to love each other as they love themselves, not competing, but cooperating, not dividing, but communion, communion not, not dead, but alive. Number five, heaven would be the van that is always at hand. We have come to the end of the ages, wrote Paul. Why would he say such a thing? Well, because at the end of the ages, the end, who is the beginning and the way, took bread. And he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me and in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. 
Peter and Judas were sitting there, and he said, drink of it. All of you. Let's get together and feel all right. Amen. <laughs> so that's why Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So he would feel all right. So let's get together and feel all right. And each one of you has a gift or gifts. And each one of them is a stewardship. And they're all worthless unless they're offered in love and then they're worth God. For God is everything that's anything. And he flows through each one of his vessels. And I don't think you can, you can really take a... I mean, I've taken all of them I, I, on how to use your gifts or whatever. You know what you have to do? You have to start bumping into people. And they'll hurt you. And you'll have to forgive them. And then they'll have to forgive you. And then you'll have a gift they don't have. And they have a gift that you don't have. And some of the gifts are really amazing. And sometimes God, he gives ecstasies. I mean, I... It, St. Paul had one. Some of you have had them, and they happen. And he gives prophetic words that are just kind of freak you out. And I've seen him heal people. I've seen a lot of people trying to fake it so that, because that would be cool, you know, but it happens. And some of you have gifts of service, and you think, oh, that's just me. Well, if you think it's just you, well, then you just, you just took a gift and turned it into an abomination. It's not you. God made you. Every good thing comes... Uh, it comes, it comes from him. So you all have, you all have gifts. Uh, I love that one at the end. Some of you have the gift of good cheer. That's a pretty good one. Share that one. Um, at the end of our service, Ted will be down front here. And Ted, uh, he has some pretty cool gifts. Um, and I mean that in that way. They're all cool. But if you'd like Ted to pray for you, he'd love to pray for you. But I do pray that you would... Church is frustrating because as a pastor, you're just trying to get people together so they would feel all right. So you have this program, you have that program, whatever. Um, but I pray that you would bump into each other. And the next thing that uh, Peter talks about is the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. So we'll talk about that next week. But the people next to you are the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. It all turns into ecstatic joy. So in the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen.